In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Religion has probably downplayed the conflict that is taking place in the New Testament, which is a bit odd considering the fact that Jesus was ultimately brutally tortured and murdered in an extremely cruel fashion. So, there was clearly a violent conflict taking place. The book of John in particular, in my opinion, really explicitly outlines the conflict taking place, but it's throughout all of the entirety of the New Testament and the Gospel books. But we're going to take a look, especially at a portion of Luke 4 and of John chapter 8, and ultimately the the goal here is to get a reevaluation of much of this text where it's being read by the way that it's presented by most of mainstream religion without the conflict that's taking place or at least without the severity of the conflict taking place and much of it is presented as though Jesus is the sage wise monk offering advice while you know, speaking softly and just making gentle correction, um, and it ha and presents people as coming to him seeking advice when, in fact, they are most likely coming seeking to accuse him, or to trip him up, or get him to say something that will allow them to legally be allowed to kill him. Um, and so the conflict is stripped of the text. And when we put this conflict back in the text, all of a sudden it reads in a completely different manner and fashion and tells a completely different story. And all of a sudden things take on a different color when you see them as a conflict that is ultimately going to re result in a brutal murder. And so we're going to start here with this passage here that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so... Quite likely, religion has downplayed this to you, maybe even explicitly telling you don't make too much of this, presenting it perhaps as the law was given by Moses and then at a later point in time, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, or the law was given by Moses and then when the dispensation of grace came, Jesus came and gave the full revelation of grace, as though these things are not contrary to one another. And what's happening here is these things are contrary to one another. And to boil it down in the most usable fashion that applies to you and me today here in 2019, law is performance-based religion. It is where your value as a human being is determined by your achievement and your performance as a human being. You're as good as the things that you do, and you are as bad as the things that you do. You are completely defined by do. So as I call this uh, performance or value-based, uh, performance or achievement-based value. I got those words wrong. Um, so your value is as good as you are. And that's what law is. That's what, when, when, the, when the New Testament passages speak of walking by the flesh, it's talking about walking by law. When it talks about the world, it's talking about the law of Moses. So if we want to apply this not necessarily as the law of Moses per se, it's still the concept of law, which is a concept that your value is determined by your performance. And that God, in fact, determines your value by performance, and so therefore do all people. Now grace and truth is completely opposite to this. Grace and truth says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, grace and truth is a message that your value is intrinsic. It's inherent. You have value of the highest degree because you exist. And all people are equal in that regard. What your performance does neither subtracts from nor adds to your value. Since your value is infinite, it cannot be added upon, and since it is infinite, it cannot be subtracted from. 
So this is a message of intrinsic value, of inborn value. A message that says you are born in the image and likeness of God, and nothing can take that away, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. So your performance does not determine your value. Your achievement does not determine your value. What you do wrong does not subtract from your value, and what you do that is kind does not add to your value. Therefore, what you have then is that the law had a, 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 a value system where, uh, in particular, during this time that, the, that these things are taking place, the leadership saw that if you had a disease or if you were blind, if you had a, a speech impediment, if you had a mental defect, if you were poor, if, uh, if you were uh, you know, born of, of illegitimate means, whatever it was, that these things happened to you because you were a dirty, filthy, disgusting sinner. And God doesn't like you, and that's God's punishment against you. That you are in your sorry state by your own fault, or the fault of your parents, because it could be a generational curse. But one way or another, if you were if you were born in the wrong place at the wrong time, of the wrong means, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're suffering, that was because that was the punishment of God. So when you looked upon someone less fortunate than you, the drive was not to help that person because they were, they were less fortunate than you because they're a filthy, disgusting sinner. So you didn't help the needy. You looked down upon them and you spit upon them and said, you're filthy, disgusting sinner. And so that's completely opposite of a message where you see somebody in need and you help that person. And so the New Testament message is actually about helping the needy, about comforting the grieving, and it's about treating people as equals. One of the things religion has done wrong is it's taken the word iniquity and it's turned it into something other than what it is. And what iniquity is, is inequality. And it is when you look at somebody as unequal to yourself, you look at people as unequal to each other. And the reason you would do this is when you value based on performance. Because if you value based on performance, one person's performance is better than another. Therefore, one person is better than another. That is iniquity. That is inequality. Whereas grace and truth says all people are created equal. All people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the message of grace and truth. And when you look at it that way, and someone is in need, well, that someone is just as valuable as you are. If you have the means to help that person, then you need to help that person, because that person is just in a state of misfortune. That person is not in a state of punishment from God for being a filthy, disgusting sinner. And so this is what rethink, repent, rethink and believe the gospel. Rethink and believe that all people are equal. And that's the message that's being presented here. The message of grace, however, is always hated re by religious people because religious people always want to have somebody, for some reason, that is in their state or deserves a punishment or that justice is retribution or that there's some reason not to forgive something that they've done or that there's something about their, their performance that does subtract from their humanity or there's something about their performance that does make them the chosen elect. And so they hate the message of grace because it says that all people are equal. It says that everybody is loved by God. So first we're going to take a look here in Isaiah chapter 61 in verses 1 and 2 as a preparation for the passage in Luke 4. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, that would be the needy. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So, in this passage, we see the day of vengeance of our God is part of what is the message of comfort. Is a comfort is a message of saying those who have wronged you will have hell to pay. They're going to get theirs. God is going to take revenge on on them for you. And so this is the message in Isaiah, as the passage is presented, that one of the reasons that you can have comfort in 
in your state of being is to know that God is going to take revenge. Well now, here in Luke chapter 4, we have Jesus, and it says, uh, starting in chapter 4, verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he's now going to read the passage that we just went over. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. So let's pause here for a second. And when we see this passage that he quoted from Isaiah, he purged from it the part about vengeance of God. There was no vengeance in the message that he portrayed because he's already taking a stab at the philosophy that they had where your value is based on your performance and God is going to take revenge for you. He's saying that the comfort is that God loves you, not that God will take revenge on your behalf. And this infuriated them. So at this point, they're already wondering what is wrong with this guy? What, what is he doing? Why is he taking out the best part of this verse? And so... When it says in verse 22, all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? They were not impressed and in amazement and thinking like, wow, this, this guy is pretty cool. They were going, what is wrong with this guy? And so that's why he said, you will surely say to me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Essentially, he's saying, I know you're going to say, I'm out of my freaking mind. What am I doing? What, what is wrong with you? You need help, pal. I don't know what's wrong with you, but you need some help. That's the kind of response that he's receiving here. And the reason he's receiving this response is because he has taken vengeance away from God. And that's just infuriating these people. Their comfort in the world was to know that God's going to take revenge one way or another on their enemies. And Jesus has a message that is one of restoration instead of retribution, and one of healing instead of one of hurting. And he's got a message of saying, return evil with love instead of with returning harm with harm. You know, recompense no man evil for evil is the message rather than, which which is another way of saying you don't return harm for harm. Two wrongs don't make a right, but we think two wrongs do make a right. In fact, we call it justice when, when two wrongs equal each other out. We think an eye for an eye, for a tooth for a tooth, but he says, you know, love your enemy. Pray for those who hurt you. That is the opposite of the vengeance of God. That is saying God is love. That is saying there is no there is no fear in love because fear has to do with punishment. He's taking the punishment away from God. He's taking the punitive measure away from their theology. And they're furious by this. And they think he's out of his mind. And he's saying, I know you're going to tell me I'm out of my mind. But now he's going to provoke them further because he's going to say, I'm not out of my mind because these people from other nations that you think God's going to take revenge on, let me give you two examples that you know from your history of your prophets where God helped Gentiles. So he continues and he says, but I tell you of a truth here in verse 25. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elias, when the heavens was shut up three years and six months, when a great famine was throughout all the land. 
But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. So, Elijah didn't go to any of the Jews. He did not go to anybody from the tribe of Israel, any of the tribes of Israel. He went to a foreign city, to a woman that was a foreigner, and helped her. Verse 27, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Again, nobody of their bloodline was cleansed. It was Naaman, a Gentile, who was cleansed. A foreigner, a stranger, a filthy, disgusting pig dog, a filthy, disgusting, not one of the elect. That's who was healed. So he's saying, I'm not making a mistake or a personal judgment in taking vengeance away from God. I'm telling you, this is who God is. God loves everyone. And so now they're really infuriated. So verse 28, it says, And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And again, this being astonished at his doctrine is not mightily impressed. It's not a positive response. They are furious. They want to kill him. They wanted to throw him down from a great height and murder him, because he said, God loves your enemies. So, this is the opposite of their theology. This is the opposite of their belief, belief system. He is not fine-tuning what they believe. He, is, he has come to discard it and to throw it out. He is at war with the law of Moses. And in the book of John in particular, you will see that he calls it the law of Moses. He says that the law is from Moses. Okay, he does not call it God's law, like many of your biblical teachers will do, and treat it as though this came from God. He's saying this is not from God, this is from Moses. And I'm here to tell you about what is from God. It's a very different message. And so, we're going to take a little preview here in John chapter 7. And in verse 19, he says, Did not Moses give you the law? And let yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? And the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goes about to kill thee? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and, all ye, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. And one thing to understand here is if you think that the idea of circumcision is weird, good, because so does Jesus. He thinks it's disgusting that they mutilate people genitally, and and that is what they think is is by righteousness. Paul went a step further. He said he said you know these people that are for this that they think that's that's what makes you righteous. You snip the tip. I wish they'd cut the whole thing. Okay, this is a perception where they are opposed to the act of mutilating genitalia. Okay, they think that's barbaric and disgusting, and so do I. Um, and so he's saying that they think it's okay to, to take a baby and mutilate his genitalia on the Sabbath day, but here he's healed a man on the Sabbath. And they think that he's done some great disservice that they're angry at him because he made a man whole. He healed them on the Sabbath. And... Um, so then in verse 25, then said some of them of Jerusalem, is this not he whom they seek to kill? So they want to kill him. They do not like him. This is a violent conflict. This is not a, a minor disagreement. This isn't a friendly philosophical discussion where they agree to disagree. He is at war against these people, and they want to kill him because they don't like his message because his message is attempting to overthrow what they have always believed. So now we get into John chapter 8. And here's an important thing to understand because we're going to see this here at the beginning of chapter 8 where they want to trap him. They want to get him put into a position where they can now justify killing him. And this is what's happening here when we see uh, the, the woman caught in adultery is they want to trap him and get him so where they can justify killing him. 
so they uh, they bring to him. Let's see. We'll we'll take a. Uh, uh, verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. You see? So the whole purpose of this exercise to begin with is so that they can have a reason to legitimately kill him. They're trying to justify being able to murder him. So they brought this woman in adultery. They're asking him about the law of Moses. And they're challenging him to say, you know, screw the law. Because if he says screw the law, they can kill him. But, you know, so they're, they're, they're attempting to trick him. And what I want to present is the idea that some of these things that we've looked at and thought that people were seeking Jesus' advice might have been trying to get him in a position where they could trick him and accuse him and be allowed to kill him. So rethink that when approaching things such as the rich young ruler and the Nicodemus story. Because I think those are variations of each other, in fact. But I'm not sure that when uh, the rich young ruler, I mean, we, we think of him as rich and as young, but we forget the fact that he's a ruler which means that he's a leader of the synagogue, which means that he's got his well-studied theology. He's well-versed. He knows the law. And so when he's coming, he's not coming to Jesus for advice. When he says, good master, and Jesus says, why do you call me good? I suggest that he's saying, why do you call me good? Because what he's really saying is, I know what you people think of me. You think I'm a glutton. You think I'm a drunkard. You think I'm born of illegitimate birth. You don't think I'm good. You, 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 you know, why are you coming to me saying good master? So what he's doing is stating the conflict. I think that the rich young ruler is a story of a leader of the synagogue tempting him that he might have to accuse him, as this verse here in John 8 is saying. So anyway, they bring the woman. They say, uh, this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now, many people have taken this passage with him writing in the in the dirt, and they said, you know, there's something about what he's writing, or, you know, I've heard it said that, well, he's just stopping to think about how he should proceed. But I think this part that here in italics, as though he heard them not, is actually a correct interpretation. I think what he's doing is saying, these people are, are trying to, you know, trying to accuse me, they're trying to accuse this woman, I want no part in this. So he's actively ignoring them. The purpose of stating that he's writing in his finger on the ground is that he's not merely ignoring them. He's making sure they know he's ignoring them because he wants no part in this act of condemnation. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a, a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, being, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those, that, uh, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus is not in the business of condemning people for their performance. He's in the business of showing people the love of God, a God who does not open his mouth in accusation, a God who is not the accuser. In fact, devil means accuser. So if you think that if you have a theology where when you die, you stand before God and he points a finger of accusation at you, you have a God who is quite literally the devil. So we're going to proceed here. And Jesus, uh, verse 12, then, Jesus, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is all, uh, uh, verse 17. 
It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself and the father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then they said unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered. Okay, so this is an accusation about, you know, the circumstances of his birth. Um, then they said unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered, ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should know my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour is not yet come. But they wanted to kill him. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And then he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. They answered unto him and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. They said to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinced me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is not of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil. Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I answer my, honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so, they want to kill him. He's got a message that's contrary to everything that they hold dear. And the core of that message is that he's taken vengeance away from God and replaced it with love for everyone. 
So keep in mind when going through the New Testament that the, those who were followers and practicers of, and especially the leaders of, the law of Moses, and as it applies today, those who promote a system whereby your achievement determines your value, your performance determines your value. That is what is being taken to task here. And when you take that to task, those people are always going to want to kill you. 